Okay, so setting the stage, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. Uh, I am the former director of services from KidsLink. KidsLink is a mid-size uh, uh, child and family service organization in Waterloo Region. Uh, we have a, a very large children's mental health uh, component uh, and, a, and a very large, I think, residential treatment component. Uh, about five years ago, we were uh, seeing a lot of kids come for treatment that came from the most serious trauma backgrounds that we've seen in many, many years, and Kids Link is over 153 years old. Uh, not that I was there that long, but, uh, you know, there's a long history of working with traumatized kids at Kids Link. Uh, we were very concerned about the rise in medications that we were dispensing to children and really becoming disillusioned, I think, about you know, um, you know, effectively supporting children and families uh, to become healthy and uh, and thrive. Um, our physical restraints were uh, on the rise in the residential program, and if you're new to that sector, this is a major focus of trauma-informed care to reduce physical restraints in inpatient uh, treatment programs. Uh, so certainly, we were concerned. Uh, and so we started to look for um, some of the newer literature on, on uh, uh, treating kids and families. And we came across the trauma-informed system of care literature. In about 2009, we decided to travel to the U.S. to take a look at some programs that were implementing uh, what, uh, this, this new approach to, to, to organizations to become trauma-informed. Uh, we traveled to an organization in Maine called Thrive, which is one of the first funded uh, trauma-informed organizations in the U.S. They were funded about eight years ago with $9 million to educate service providers on trauma-informed care. So certainly they're leaders in the field, and I would encourage you to uh, visit their website. I can... Um, uh, tell you about resources at the end of the presentation. And we also visited the Andrus Center in uh, Yonkers, New York, where uh, the sanctuary model uh, is being implemented. Now, the sanctuary model is one model of trauma-informed care that uh, a lot of children's service organizations are adopting across the U.S. Um, and uh, in Australia. Uh, and if you're interested, you can certainly take a look at their website as well. Uh, eventually, KidsLink decided to implement uh, a, a, a blueprint for trauma for transforming the organization to a trauma-informed service system, and they've been working on that for about three years. The board then decided that uh, we really needed to start to communicate with our service partners and talk more about the, uh, the promise of trauma-informed care in the theory and practice. And in particular, what we're trying to do is implement, influence decision makers, influence educators, uh, and uh, work together with uh, organizations like the, the Crime Prevention Council to really get the word out to others about what trauma-informed care is about. Okay, so let's take a look at a definition of trauma. This is one that KidsLink adopted. There are many definitions of trauma. Uh, however, you know, uh, it, it, the, the bottom line is uh, it's how the person who's experienced a potentially traumatic event uh, reacts to that event that really defines the trauma. Uh, and although this one, uh, you know, is pretty succinct, we've got community stakeholders uh, that have uh, said to us, uh, particularly in the child uh, welfare sector, that frequent moves and separations and losses in the lives of people uh, are potentially traumatic. And certainly we know that uh, uh, the, the recent um, events around bullying uh, are, are teaching us a lot in terms of what can be uh, traumatic to young people. Uh, and, and again, it's how the person experiences the incidents or incident that is typically extremely frightening and threatening. So we know that trauma can interfere with a child's ability to think and learn, and that uh, recent studies have even demonstrated how exposure to trauma can interfere with healthy brain development, and I'll talk a little bit about that later, uh, that the long-term uh, consequences of experiencing traumatic events include substance abuse, poor school performance, uh, mental health disorders, and physical health conditions. And we'll talk about a very important uh, general population study uh, 
that tells us uh, that uh, we've got to really pay attention to the experience that all of us may or could have related to potentially traumatic events. Traumatized children and youth may lose much of their capacity uh, to manage and control their emotions and may suffer from trauma-induced mood changes, irritability, depression, and anger and that are not only disabling for them but really have profound effects uh, on families and on communities. And that's uh, a really important um, factor to consider when you think about the approach to trauma-informed care being really about changing a system and how we think about uh, the people that we work with. Um, certainly, the capacity to form healthy emotional relationships gets uh, diminished. And tragically, uh, the consequences of trauma can affect future generations as traumatized children grow up to adulthood and become parents uh, and so on. And so there's lots of literature in that area as well. I talked a little bit about the importance of the variability of the response to a potentially traumatic event or stressor. And that's really about, you know, what's the objective nature of the event? Uh, and then the person's, uh, obviously, the response to that. So something that's traumatic to one child or one person may not be traumatic to another. And so that's um, important. There's a quote here by Darby that I use in my presentation that says, it's not the event that determines whether something is traumatic, but the individual's uh, experience of the event. In terms of, uh, you know, how potentially traumatic events may affect someone, we look at seven different uh, sort of factors that are important. So at what age and developmental stage did the event occur? Uh, and then certainly what's the perception of the danger? Uh, how, whether or not uh, the, the uh, person experiencing the event uh, is a victim uh, or a witness to a potentially adverse event. Uh, a child's relationship to the victim or perpetrator is also important to consider. Uh, and again, um, in adults. I talk a lot about children because uh, the earlier that uh, a trauma is experienced, and without intervention, the more damaging uh, the, the effects of trauma. So that's really important to consider. Also, what are the adversities the child faces following the trauma? You know, were there protective factors? Were there resources available to the child? Uh, was there immediate support and so on? Um, and the presence and availability of, the, uh, you know, supportive adults in a child's life uh, is really important, and of course, it's a protective factor. Uh, and I want to go over uh, the epidemiology and pre prevalence trauma. This is the, the, the research stuff. I, I, I really am, uh, you know, uh, attracted to the research. I think that it's really important that we have a good sense of what's happening uh, in terms of understanding uh, the, the, the studies that are going on in terms of child trauma. Uh, and, you know, we've, we've got some studies that are older that are still very, very important in considering the, uh, the trauma-informed care literature and the theory and practice. We'll look at a, a, a very important general population study that's really um, so important to us in the field uh, first. Uh, and then we'll spend some time on studies that I uh, refer to as studies in, on vulnerable populations. We're not going to talk about disaster studies, but there are hundreds of disaster studies out there uh, that uh, help us understand the prevalence uh, of trauma in our society. And, uh, but with, there's just not enough time to cover that stuff. So in terms of general population study, as I mentioned, the study by uh, Folletti and Anda called the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study from 1998 is probably the most important study that's ever been done on trauma. And uh, the, the importance of this study is that um, the, um, the, the pr principal investigators looked at the experience of, an, uh, of over 1,700 people uh, by going into the files of a major healthcare provider in the U.S. and, and looking at those files over many, many years uh, to, to come up with uh, some very interesting and, and, and uh, to some disturbing evidence 
that trauma is certainly uh, prevalent in our society. Uh, you know, uh, the adverse uh, childhood experience study took place over 10 years. I mentioned there were over 17,000 people involved in the study, um, and it is the largest study that's ever been done on this subject. Uh, in terms of uh, what they found, uh, they, uh, you know, one in four people were exposed to at least two categories of adverse childhood experiences. Now, what the authors did uh, is, is developed a list of potentially uh, traumatizing incidents uh, that they then searched for in the files uh, of the 17,000 people involved in the study. Uh, and in terms of... Uh, you know, what, what they found, uh, again, one in four exposed to at least two significant potentially traumatic events. One in 16 were exposed to four categories of traumatic events. 22% of this group was sexually abused as children, and 66% of the women uh, in the study experienced uh, violence or family strife in childhood. Uh, you know, eventually what uh, Folletti and Anda concluded is that the daily cost of the experience of traumatic events in the U.S. is significant. And in fact, they suggested that the daily cost of childhood abuse and neglect alone comes to about $258 million. A little uh, different way to take a look at how uh, the ACEs study uh, affects our development is that the higher the ACE score, the greater likelihood of uh, severe and persistent emotional problems. So the higher, the more exposure any of us may have to potentially traumatic events, the more uh, we see uh, uh, emotional issues, health risk behaviors in, in our efforts to cope with uh, traumatic events. Uh, those are quite significant. Serious social problems are also a piece that, that uh, we look at in terms of for the outcome of having experienced those events. Adult disease and disability, uh, high health and mental health care costs, and the bottom line, early death, uh, and certainly poor life expectancy. So, you know, really, in summary, uh, adverse childhood experiences, traumatic events cause disrupted neurodevelopment, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. That's the neuroplasticity, brain development stuff that uh, we're hearing more and more about. Uh, it certainly, it uh, interferes with social, emotional, and cognitive impairment, and then uh, leading to the adoption, uh, uh, the adoption of high-risk uh, behaviors. Um, you know, using drugs and alcohol and other things to in a, an attempt to cope with some of the effects. So let's talk about the psychobiology piece, the neuroplasticity piece. I mentioned that I'm not a scientist, nor am I a medical practitioner. Uh, I'm a social worker, uh, but, you know, I, I believe that more and more it's important for us to understand how trauma affects the brain. Uh, and it, we know from the research uh, that uh, exposure to trauma in early childhood does have long-lasting effects because it alters the course of, of a child's normal development and can change the structure of the brain. Human brains, of course, do most of their development after birth, making us vulnerable to the effects of disruptions and traumatic experiences. And we know now that human brains are uh, incredibly malleable and that experiences shape the brain's development even more than genetics, meaning that trauma can change the brain's structure while it's still growing. And that's an important piece. In terms of childhood, because there's rapid growth going on, uh, it leaves children uh, particularly vulnerable to, uh, to um, the issues related to experiences of trauma. So let's talk about what happens. You know, uh, I'm sure that many of you have uh, explored um, some of the literature on how we function under pressure uh, and uh, in, in highly frightening uh, and dangerous situations, how the body reacts. Well, for children, you know, it really begins with fear and, and faced with a threat. You know, the body sort of takes on this sort of cascade of emotions. Adrenaline surges, 
the heart starts to pound, blood pressure soars, uh, and then we, the body sort of takes us into this fight or flight um, approach. Uh, the, it's, the, it, the main issue is the production of, of cortisol in the brain. Now, excess cortisol production in the brain uh, is what then leads to the disruption in the development uh, and the effect on the brain's neurons. And so um, if you've heard of the, the, the term cortisol, it's, it's really the key component that's involved in the body's response to stress, both physical and emotional. And it, it leads to the increase in blood sugar levels, uh, blood pressure, it suppresses the immune system, and so on. Uh, and, but adrenaline also works for us. The production increases our alertness, our energy level. Uh, and it increases our metabolism. Uh, and, but, and cortisol has widespread actions which help restore us to uh, uh, a level of equilibrium after we've experienced an, a, a frightening event. The problem with what happens with kids who, and those of us that have ex been exposed to repeated frightening events is that Excess cortisol that's being developed in the brain leads to damage in the brain region known as the hippocampus. It causes memory lapses, anxiety, and inability to control emotional outbursts, and so on. And cortisol and other brain chemicals can also alter the brain center's uh, ability to regulate attention. And when you think about our kids in the school system who may have been, you know, exposed to family violence repeatedly, what the, what this, uh, can mean to them in terms of their ability to sit and listen in a classroom, um, it's very, very significant in terms of understanding what happens to kids, uh, from this perspective. So, you know, can, can a child focus on what's happening in a class, in a classroom? or is a jackhammer that's, you know, um, loud and, and going on, you know, construction outside interfering with, uh, with their ability to focus. Let's talk about, let's talk about population studies now, because I think this is what I'll call the speed round. Uh, these are uh, really important in terms of understanding the prevalence of trauma across all sectors. I'm not going to go, here's a list of some of the literature reviews that I've done. I'm not going to go over all of the uh, research in these areas, but I, I, again, I've got uh, resources uh, for you that you can um, get to, and I'll talk about that at the end. Uh, there is a wealth of information on all of these areas and way too much to review here. But let's go to some of the main ones. Uh, in terms of those um, children, youth, and families that present at the front door of community mental health clinics, the research says to us that between 51 and 98% of those people, including those with a diagnosis of schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, have been exposed to some kind of childhood abuse or sexual abuse. And most have multiple experiences of trauma. So that's uh, something that needs to be considered. In terms of child welfare, some of the new literature out there, from, uh, in particular from 2011, suggests that more than 90% of the kids in the child welfare system have been exposed to at least one significantly traumatic event. And you can imagine that that's the case. Uh, and that, in fact, 75% uh, have been exposed to moderate and major events. So by the time most children enter the child welfare system, they've already been exposed to a wide range of painful, painful and distressing experiences, many of which remain unknown and unreported during the intake stage. Uh, foster placements often separate children from what's familiar and beloved in primary caregivers and family members, friends, community. Uh, and in, a, in addition, children in the child welfare system typically face uh, many other sources of stress that can challenge child welfare's ability to intervene. These include poverty, racism, and other forms of discrimination. We talked about separations and frequent moves, school problems, grief and loss is significant. And then, of course, the experience of refugees and immigrants is, uh, is particularly poignant.
In another study of uh, children in foster care, um, they found that uh, a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder could, uh, did occur in 60% of the kids in, in this study, which occurred in 1999. Okay, so let's talk about youth justice. In the youth justice system, some new stuff coming out in 2010 uh, that says to us that 75 to 93 percent of youth entering the system have experienced trauma. Now, uh, there is a high correlation between childhood traumatic life experiences and becoming involved in the juvenile justice system, uh, and, the, uh, and that's a really important um, connection to make when considering uh, how we intervene and how we understand kids in the juvenile justice system. And, and we know that the behaviors associated with trauma, how one reacts and attempts to cope, uh, often look very similar to um, what's considered to be delinquent behavior. In substance abuse, uh, we know uh, from this study from 2005, 67% of people in substance use treatment report histories of childhood abuse and neglect. There's lots of research coming out now on uh, experiences of trauma uh, and undiagnosed uh, PTSD in those that are in substance abuse treatment. Uh, and so, you know, this is a very important um, focus. A lot of my colleagues working with uh, children, youth, and families uh, in this area are talking more and more and more about becoming trauma-informed. Okay, so that was a very quick overview of only three of the areas. Uh, from the prevalence data, we really begin to understand that trauma is epidemic uh, and that the victims of trauma uh, fall across all sectors of care. So we know that uh, the majority of children and youth in mental health and psychiatric treatment settings, settings have trauma history, histories. A sizable percentage of youth in the youth justice system have trauma histories. Uh, a, size of, a sizable percentage of people in substance abuse uh, treatment uh, have traumatic stress sy symptoms that interfere with their ability to achieve sobriety. Uh, and that, uh, that there are, in fact, very high risks of traumatic experience amongst children with developmental disabilities uh, and certainly amongst refugees and uh, refugee children and families. So, uh, you know, the bottom line is increasingly we are appreciating that, that uh, there's a range of other issues that can be associated with tra early traumatic experience and trauma itself. Uh, and uh, so that's an important piece for us to understand. The other thing that's really important about this is that trauma is often misdiagnosed and misinterpreted. And I don't believe there's, uh, I don't think we ask whether or not there's an, um, any psychologists on the line with us, but uh, one of the major issues is the, uh, the, the way that post-traumatic stress disorder is diagnosed, particularly in children. And so if you've got an interest in taking a look at the complexities of that area, please do. Uh, when it's misdiagnosed, though, uh, trauma uh, often results in a diagnosis in children of anxiety, ADHD, bipolar disorder, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, oppositional defiant disorder, conduct disorder. If you're from the mental health field, you'll be familiar with all of those uh, childhood disorders. And the symptoms of these disorders overlap with the symptoms of post-traumatic stress we talked about. How do you know when it's trauma versus other things? Well, there are a number of assessments that are available to us that help that will help us differentiate this. The bottom line is that uh, as a society and as service providers, we are we understand that uh, a great deal of the people that we work with will in fact be suffering from early trauma, and so that's important.